and welcome back to Fairly Critical. I am your host, Jacob. Thank you guys so much for taking time out of your day to watch our video. 2022 will be at an end in less than two short weeks. This year was filled with new television shows and movies for our entertainment. Some were good, some were not. And today we're going to rank all of the shows and movies that we saw this year from worst to best. While some of the shows and movies that appear on our list may not have released in 2022, we saw them for the first time this year and wanted to give an objective ranking for everything we looked at. Even then, most of them will have released in 2022, so it won't be a huge discrepancy. Of course, it is not possible for us to have seen every single new project that came out this year, so if you saw something that we do not mention, tell us in the comments what you saw and where you think it would be on our list. While you are there, be sure to give this video a like to help us out in the algorithm, subscribe to the channel if you did like it, and share this with your friends if you think they would enjoy it as well. Thank you all for your support, now let's rank everything we saw in 2022. Number 22, She-Hulk, Attorney at Law, Season 1. If you've seen our review on this show, its placement at the bottom of the list should be no surprise. 90% of the runtime is filler content, the ending severs what little connected tissue there was between its 9 episodes in half, and most of its characters are unlikable. I will speak no more. Number 21, Halo Season 1. God, I hate this show. As a fan of the Halo IP, I hate this show to my very core. It took fan-favorite characters and completely changed their personality and stories, put emotion-killing implants in the Spartans in a vain attempt to rush a Chief vs. the UNSC storyline that went absolutely nowhere, and also did this. To be fair, if you are not a fan of the Halo IP, you can look at this show and say it is an average or slightly below average sci-fi show, and that is the only reason why it is not at the very bottom of our rankings. If you are a Halo fan, then this show is probably the only thing you can look at and say it makes me angrier than Halo 5. I am certain that we will talk more about Season 1 as we get closer to the release of Season 2, but for now, its low placement on our list will have to do. Number 20. The Invitation. Like I said in our review of this movie, it was a clever play with the vampire mythos, and the acting and directing were more than adequate. That is where the compliments stop, though, as this is a non-scary horror movie with a dismal screenplay encumbered by heavy-handed political rhetoric. Additionally, it is easily forgotten, and that is why it finds itself low on our rankings. Number 19, Ms. Marvel Season 1. Ms. Marvel started off with excellent visual storytelling, fun and enjoyable characters, and a strong story foundation. As it went on, the visual effects dropped off, the characters failed to grow, and the story became bewildering. Not to mention the fact that they decided to tack on Mutant to Kamala's power origin for no apparent reason other than making every enhanced person in the universe attached to the M-word. What might be the worst problem, though, is the abrupt turnaround of the villain and their death a full episode before the finale. Ultimately, the show started high and ended very, very low. Number 18, Beetlejuice. I had never watched Beetlejuice until this year's Halloween season. I know, my wife didn't believe it either. What I cannot believe is this movie. I am still not sure I fully understand what the heck was happening. Don't get me wrong, I understand the story. It's pretty simple. But why half of what I saw made it into the final cut, I really cannot say. I am sure that the dedicated members of Tim Burton's fandom love this film, but I simply don't get it. Number 17, Thor Love and Thunder. We did a review of this movie as well, and I went into a more detailed breakdown of what the story should have been in our Phase 4 retrospective video. While there are a handful of good things I can say about it, the level of disappointment I feel about the movie makes it my least favorite Marvel film release to date. Earning the number 17 spot on this year's list, I can only hope to forget about this movie, in its entirety. Number 16, Hocus Pocus 2. We all know why Hocus Pocus was given a sequel, and it isn't because they had a quality story to tell. While there are parts of this movie that are legitimately entertaining, there are also plot holes and character decisions that show us exactly why some movies just don't need a second one, especially when the first one had such a satisfying conclusion to its original story. While the movie itself is fairly well placed and put together, the questionable character decisions, especially by Winifred, land it squarely in the lower half of our list. 
Number 15, Where the Crawdads Sing. Where the Crawdads Sing was a film adaptation of Delia Owen's book by the same name. As with most book adaptations, the movie does not quite hold up to its printed predecessor, as it fails to deliver the same emotion that the book provides. Adaptations are not as easy as you might think. In this case, a 10-hour read had to be condensed into a 1-hour and 25-minute movie. Things had to be cut out, and scenes that played really well in the book just didn't translate to the screen like they were meant to. When you adapt a book to the screen, you have to put a little more work to ensure the emotions and decision-making of its characters are expressed correctly, and the film just wasn't able to do that for us. Number 14, Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. I have very mixed feelings about this movie. While we never did a full review of this film, we did do a list video highlighting some of the good and bad parts of it. On one hand, we had a fun, creative, and entertaining action film. On the other hand, the script was one huge cliché and couldn't figure out if it liked being an action film or wanted to be in the horror genre. While the character development of Doctor Strange is well thought out, the character degeneration of Wanda is hard to swallow. For every good, there is a bad, and that lands Multiverse of Madness in the 14th position. Number 13, Black Panther, Wakanda Forever. This is the point of the list where we go from mostly negative or neutral to mostly positive. Wakanda Forever was a breath of fresh air for the MCU in 2022, following the disappointments of She-Hulk, Love and Thunder, Multiverse of Madness, and Ms. Marvel. While a more stripped-down version of the screenplay would have served the emotional plot far better, it is certainly a good movie that sees the main protagonist come to terms with her identity as the new Black Panther. It is worth the watch if you have not already seen it, and it's a worthwhile ending to Phase 4. Number 12, Press Play. Press Play hits a bit of a soft spot for our channel. We were able to interview the film's director, which gave us greater insight into its production. And while the first act would have benefited from more time to fully support the blossoming relationship of our protagonists, the compelling and relational dialogue delivered by a superb cast and its fresh take on a strong message earns it the number 12 spot. If you haven't seen it yet, we do highly recommend it for your next date night. Number 11, Moon Knight Season 1. Moon Knight was an entertaining show with solid characters, and while the kaiju fight at the end was a bit much, the dialogue between Layla and multiple personalities of Mark Spector is fairly compelling. It was a solid way to start out the MCU in 2022, and would remain the high point for the studio until Wakanda Forever released last month. The addition of a worthwhile villain and understated visual storytelling puts this project just outside the top 10. Number 10, The Gray Man. If Chris Evans wanted to ensure he didn't get typecast as Captain America, this film certainly accomplished it. Evans' charismatic psychopath plays incredibly well with the huge cast in this high-octane thrill ride, and he's not even the main character. Ryan Gosling shows he has the chops to lead his own action franchise along Anna de Armas, Jessica Henwick, and Roger Jean Page. While this film did suffer slightly from pushing quite a lot of material into its runtime, the Russo brothers nailed the ending, and we cannot wait for the next one. Number 9, Sleepy Hollow. Another Tim Burton entry and another one of his films that I had not seen prior to this year. This is actually one that I really wanted to watch, and I am glad to say that it satisfied my curiosity. While I am still not a huge fan of Tim Burton's blend of stylized humor and horror, it was far less prevalent than it was in Beetlejuice. When you add in an all-star cast led by Johnny Depp, a well-crafted mystery and excellent set design and atmosphere, Sleepy Hollow sets itself apart from many of the entries on this list. Plus, it has Casper Van Dien dying to a headless horseman. Ha, Rico. You can survive Clendathu, but no one survives Christopher Walken. Number 8, Bullet Train. One of my favorite movies of the year, the stellar cast and witty dialogue of David Leitch's Bullet Train are thoroughly entertaining. Placed in the chaotic setting of nearly a dozen hitmen on a high-speed train, the film elevates itself above a standard action flick with a strong personal narrative. The third act dialogue of Hiroyuki Sonata's Elder and Brad Pitt's Ladybug completely reframes the entire film, and the connections between each of the seemingly random events and writers keeps the brain active while watching the mayhem occur. Truly a satisfying film that earns the number 8 spot. Number 7, Dune. An example of how a book adaptation can be done correctly, Dune gave us the foundations of a universe that is truly breathtaking. It didn't even make it through the first book, choosing instead to end about two-thirds of the way through it to ensure it could cover everything it needed to faithfully. While you could say that the main character does not have a true story arc, I don't believe that is entirely true. 
For most of the movie, Paul Atreides has not been in control of his own life, and by the end of the movie, he takes the first actions into seizing his destiny and avenging his father. There is an arc. It is a small arc that you would normally see occur within the first act of most movies, but it is an arc nonetheless. Regardless, it is a well-shot and paced film bolstered by incredible sound design that captures the imagination and leaves you wanting more. Number 6. Spider-Man No Way Home Considered by most to be the best MCU film of Phase 4, No Way Home gave us a satisfying conclusion for three different eras of Spider-Man. The endpoint of the film seems to match the emotional story for each one perfectly as Spidey 1 sets about rebuilding his life, Spidey 2 gets a chance to be better, and Spidey 3 gets to save the girl. Other than Doctor Strange's arrogance being just a little too difficult to believe, all of the heroes and villains act in ways that make logical sense based on what we know about them. The movie is paced well and the hero actually has to face consequences for his actions, something that you cannot say about all the films in Phase 4. While it doesn't break into our top 5, it does deserve respect for its excellent blend of action and drama. Number 5, The Last Kingdom, Season 5. If you have never seen Netflix's fantastic The Last Kingdom, stop what you are doing and go watch it. The dynamic character writing throughout the entirety of the show is some of the best in the past decade. Season 5 released back in March of 2022 and confirmed that it is the show's final season. While the last season is not The Last Kingdom's best, it was an excellent way to end the series, and I want to give it credit for knowing when enough is enough. The show definitely left itself in a place where the story could have continued, but the main protagonist finally achieved the goal he has been working towards since the very first episode, so it is the perfect time for him to finally wash his hands of court politics and rule over his lands. If I had to choose 10 television shows to take with me to a deserted island, this would certainly be one of them, and its fifth season takes our fifth spot. Number four, The Batman. If you were like me, you were concerned that when you watched Robert Pattinson in The Batman's Cape and Cowl, you would never be able to look past his role as a shiny vampire. And if you were like me, you got over that quick, fast, and in a hurry. Director Matt Reeves gave us a new, gritty version of The Cape Crusader, and Robert Pattinson did such an amazing job bringing it to life that I will forever refer to this movie as Robert Pattinson's Batman. If you watched my video on the analysis of Batman's character, you may have noticed that Pattinson meets most, if not all, of its criteria. I know there are some who said that he was not a very good Bruce Wayne, but I would argue that he never attempted to be Bruce Wayne. This movie represents the beginning of Batman's career when he hasn't crafted his public persona yet, so let's wait for the next movie before we pass judgment on that, shall we? If there is anything we should critique, it is the wasted 15 minutes where the movie teases that Thomas Wayne may not have been a Boy Scout, only to back out when it got a little too real. Thomas Wayne is traditionally depicted as the morally stoic man who represents the good in Gotham that Bruce looks up to, but a story in which he compromises his morals for the greater good could have been thoroughly intriguing. Instead, the movie puts Batman in an emotional state that Alfred immediately solves by essentially telling him that criminals are liars. In a movie with a whopping 2 hour and 57 minute runtime, that extra 15 minutes should have been allocated to other things or simply removed for the sake of the average movie goer's bladder. But the rest of the 2 hour and 42 minutes was darn near perfection and that is why it will end up being the highest ranked movie on this list. Number 3, The DCAU. I am definitely cheating with this entry. If you don't know, the DCAU stands for the DC Animated Universe, a collection of animated shows and movies that started in 1992 and technically ran until 2017, but most will have considered closed in 2006. The DCAU includes shows such as Batman the Animated Series, Superman the Animated Series, Static Shock, Batman Beyond, and both Justice League and Justice League Unlimited, just to name a few. It also has feature-length movies such as Batman Mask of the Phantasm, which is possibly the best Batman story ever put to screen. While I had seen episodes of many of these shows growing up, I committed to watching the animated universe in its entirety this year, and I am so glad that I did. It was too difficult trying to determine where entire series would land on this list, so I am simply combining them into one entry and placing it into the top three. A huge reason for the success of these shows is fantastic voice acting, and I would just like to take a moment to mourn the passing of Kevin Conroy in November due to intestinal cancer. 
Kevin began voicing Batman and Bruce Wayne in 1992 and would reprise the role in movies, television shows, and video games for the next 30 years. His voice is who we hear in our heads when we read Batman comics, and he is even the first to determine that Batman and Bruce Wayne would have different voices. He is Batman, he will always be Batman, and his legacy as the Dark Knight is one that Batman fans will carry on forever. Thank you, Kevin. Number 2, Andor Season 1. From the team that gave us Rogue One comes a Star Wars prequel revolving around the early career of Cassian Andor. Where shows like The Book of Boba Fett and Obi-Wan Kenobi received mixed reviews, this show went a long way to giving Star Wars fans hope that the IP still had good stories to tell. We did a review of the opening season on our channel and I think it is worthy of the number 2 spot on our list this year. The slow burn of the story is fantastic. It succeeds in making the galaxy far, far away feel lived in and tangible, and the way each character's story mirrors that of its counterpart adds depth to both, something we plan to discuss in another video releasing soon. When this show was first announced, we didn't want it, and now we cannot get enough of it. Number 1, Arcane Season 1. I cannot speak highly enough about this show. If you have not heard about it, it is 9 episodes of pure gold. Based off League of Legends, this is a video game adaptation that is actually good. What is that? What the f*** is that? Don't feel like you have to be a fan of League of Legends to watch it though. I have never touched that game, but I enjoyed this show so much that it is at the top of this list. Its characters are compelling, and their stories are delivered to us by excellent voice acting, the visual storytelling was able to take full advantage of the animated medium, each episode builds off the last, and the action and drama of the script are perfectly blended. Not to mention the killer opening song performed by Imagine Dragons. This has nothing to do with the story, but I actually watched the intro to each and every episode just so I could hear enemy play against the backdrop. The writers and producers of the show are certainly taking their time with season 2, as the earliest we could see it release will be late 2023, but I say good for them. If they are able to deliver a second season that is half as good as the first, then they can take all the time that they want. And there we go, my friends. That is our list. Thank you all again for taking time out of your days to support us like you are. Um, this video is releasing less than a week before Christmas, so we will not have another video before then. I will, however, try to release one on New Year's Day, so be on the lookout for that. Um, regardless, I just want to wish you all a Merry Christmas um, and a Happy New Year. If you do not believe in Christmas, then please feel free to send us your respective holiday wishes in the comments. We look forward to reading them. I've been your host, Jacob. Thank you all again, and I will see you in the next one. Computers now have primary control of critical vehicle functions. Center always knits a few extra gifts. It's lovely. <laughs>